to the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, um, it is our great honor to, to host this uh, very distinguished Moldovan delegation. Um, and an opportunity for us here in Washington to, to be able to speak uh, informally um, with, uh, with, this, with this delegation. Um, it's a great uh, opportunity for us at the Institute of Peace um, to host this uh, delegation. Uh, the Institute of Peace is, some of you are, you know, some of the people in this front row here, the first time excluding the Ambassador Smith, um, have been here, are here for the first time. So let me just uh, remind uh, the Institute of Peace was uh, put together, founded by Congress in 1984. Um, and we were designed to address conflict, and indeed violent conflict. Um, and so we do this in various places around the world. We have offices in Baghdad, we have offices in Tunis, we have offices um, in, uh, in Kabul, um, in Islamabad. So uh, around the world we do work on the uh, African continent. Um, so it's a, a range of things where we help others solve conflict. We try to solve some ourselves, um, but the conflict is, uh, is across the world, so we're working around the world. and gives us the opportunity in Washington to convene and to bring people together to have conversations about, um, about conflict. So Moldova, not in a conflict, happily. Um, I spent some time in uh, a neighboring country of Moldova and Ukraine, which is in a conflict. And so we're doing, so the Institute of Peace is doing some work in Ukraine um, on that conflict. And there, I, I can see some some similarities and some differences um, uh, between these. I mean, one is, we've already said, that uh, Ukraine is in an active war. I mean, Ukraine is fighting a war. And they're dealing with big problems internally, corruption as well. Um, Moldova is not fighting a war. And one of the things that I hope we're able to talk about today is Moldova's approach um, to the Russian troops that are on their sovereign, sovereign soil. So this is an opportunity to talk about this. Moldova is complicated. Moldova is very complicated. Um, and it's a great opportunity to have the Prime Minister and the Defense Minister and the Foreign Minister and the Minister of Economy to, uh, to help explain this to us. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, again, we have uh, the Prime Minister, um, Pavel Filip, uh, we have the Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Integration, uh, Tudor Ilyam Avansky. Close, close, almost. Uh, you can help me with this. Uh, Minister of Defense, Jürgen Sturza. Um, and Minister of Economy and Infrastructure, Tyril Gaborici. Close, that's, that's all right. And we have a brand new Moldovan ambassador to the United States, um, who is Christiana Balan. So welcome to you all. We also have a former U.S. ambassador to Moldova, um, Ambassador Smith. Um, we have another ambassador around here. I saw Bill uh, Courtney, who is uh, all the way in the back, who has been ambassador to a bunch of different places. So it's great to have uh, that kind of people here today to help us with, in this conversation. So um, the format will be that the prime minister will have some opening remarks. Um, he will then sit down on the stage. Uh, his ministers will come join him. I will have a couple of questions uh, to start us off. The main part of this uh, conversation will be yours. Um, so we look forward to your conversations, your questions, your comments about, uh, about Moldova, about anything that the Prime Minister or the others have said. So without anything further, let me invite uh, the Moldovan Prime Minister to the stage and uh, we will begin. Prime Minister. Can you confirm if you hear the translation on channel one? A voice, not the translation yet. Can you hear me? Okay. Esteemed ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, I have the privilege and happy opportunity to express on behalf of the government of the Republic of Moldova and on my behalf sincere gratitude to the Institute of Peace 
for uh, the good organization and for housing this very important event, event which is part of the series of actions aimed at strengthening the democracy and sustainable development of the Republic of Moldova. Our relationship with the United States are part of the priority objectives of the foreign affairs policy of our country. We have a strategic dialogue with the United States and of course the Republic of Moldova relies on further support of USA. As I've said, USA is a trustworthy and a very valuable partner for the Republic of Moldova and uh, we would like to further develop the relationship between our two countries which are based on sharing uh, democratic values mutually um, advantage uh, uh, cooperation in security and in trade and economic areas <coughs> The government that I represent implemented a series of measures in order to mitigate the consequences of the economic and financial crisis to enhance the democracy and to ensure a sustainable development of our country. In 2016, in early 2016, we launched a sustained effort to ensure effective implementation of reforms in key areas in order to modernize and democratize our country according to the best practices in, in the West. 2015 was a crisis year for the Republic of Moldova, a crisis which um, started <coughs> from the actions which destabilized the banking system, which uh, generated an economic crisis and which generated a political crisis. That is why the government that I represent uh, had to invest efforts in order to first stabilize the political situation, which allowed us to stabilize the economy and of course the most important thing to stabilize the banking system. That is why uh, the Republic of Moldova is aware also of the challenges that it has to cope with and fully assumes the commitments to improve its performances in good governance, to promote economic freedom, to favor investments in health and education. Uh, recently, during a uh, government decision, uh, government meeting, we approved the mid-term priorities, and I will tell you which are the three main priorities that will be implemented in the following years. It is about development of infrastructure, education, and number three, of course, a very important pillar, ensuring um, a rule of law. We plead, or would like to uh, improve the strategic dialogue uh, between the United States and uh, the Republic of Moldova and to conduct as soon as possible the meetings of its working groups. Uh, I speak about the working group on strengthening the rule of law, uh, working group on security and defense, and working group on uh, energy security. At the same time, we are grateful for the contribution of USA in promoting the regulation of the Transnistrian conflict, uh, who played a very important role in uh, uh, in having progresses in the 5 plus 2 negotiation format. And we uh, reaffirm the commitment of the government to identify a political solution already for the Transnistrian conflict by respecting the sovereignty and integrity of the Republic of Moldova. Last year, after a huge effort and after many years of lack of any progresses on the Transnistrian issue, we managed, as usually, as we have uh, <coughs> set as goals, we wanted 
to have progresses in areas that will increase the level of comfort of people living there. We have signed a number of protocolar decisions which allowed people who have agricultural lands in the security area to have access to their lands because previously Transnistria would uh, take uh, these lands without asking for any permission and they used these lands for themselves. We also found a solution for the good uh, operation of schools from Transnistria teaching in Romanian language. We also managed to open the um, circulation on a bridge that connects two banks of the Nistru River. We also signed a protocolar decision which uh, stipulates a solution that ensures interconnection in electronic communication and recently an important decision, but a very tough decision, uh, related to the providing access to cars uh, with um, license plates from Transnistria for them to be able to circulate in the international traffic. As an important objective on the bilateral agenda between Moldova and USA is to strengthen the cooperation in promoting regional stability and global stability. We believe that the Republic of Moldova should not serve as a polygon for geopolitical uh, confrontations. We would like to become a platform of cooperation that could uh, contribute to ensuring regional security. As I've said, in this area, uh, the situation is still tense in terms of security. That is why we do need further support in order to ensure peace um, in this region. Of course, it is a pity and we regret the um, security crisis in our neighboring um, uh, country, uh, which is very much felt in the Republic of Moldova by uh, actions of uh, Russian interferences. In spite of this complex context, the European path of our country is irreversible. This was declared as number one objective of the um, government that I have the honor to lead. Or uh, signing the association agreement with uh, uh, DCFTA as a component was already done. Uh, we plead for a pragmatic approach in our relationship with Russian Federation based on mutual respect and uh, uh, based on our historic relations. We would like to build a unified and solidary society where each citizen has the possibility to participate directly uh, in achieving the objectives assumed by the government, national priority objectives of the government, target at integrated the Republic of Moldova in the European area, reintegration of the country by identifying a political solution for this uh, conflicts that we have in Transnistria, ensuring um, a rule of law and building <coughs> democracy and, of course, ensuring economic growth in the Republic of Moldova. At the same time, <coughs> the Republic of Moldova is open to cooperate uh, with um, USA in order to achieve the objectives established as part of the uh, strategic dialogue. My country commits to invest efforts as a safe and valuable partner in order to increase investments in the private sector. And uh, as a conclusion, I would like to use this opportunity and to express one more time our gratitude, the gratitude uh, to the U.S. authorities for continuous support and for significant assistance provided to the Republic of Moldova aimed at strengthening democracy and uh, ensuring a functional market economy. At the same time, I want to ensure you that we will continue to invest efforts in order to build the rule of law and develop a sustainable economy, which is very much necessary for the citizens of the Republic of Moldova. Thank you very much. And I can invite the um, other ministers to come join us. So, Mr. 
Prime Minister, thank you very much for remarks. Um, now, I don't know if uh, you need the interpretation or not, but uh, let me know if there's any, any problem. Um, so we've heard a good description um, of the policies of this government. Um, and this government has, has uh, and the Prime Minister has laid out um, a very um, Western-oriented um, policy, set of policies, both on the economic side and on the security side. Um, uh, and this is part of what I was talking about when I said Moldova is complicated. Um, because on the one hand, there is the domestic set of issues. Um, and the domestic set of issues have to do, as in all countries, with reform. I mean, I include the United States. I mean, we have our reforms that we need to do. Um, you mentioned your neighbor, um, Ukraine, has its set of issues to, to reform. The, um, uh, Moldova has a particular focus on this issue right now, on election reform and judicial reform, um, because of the mayoral election in Chisinau that was contested and go, went to two courts and was overturned, causing great, great uh, uh, concern on the part of many Moldovans. So that, that's kind of the domestic side of this thing. There's also the external politics, um, and Prime Minister, you referred to that as well. Um, um, the external politics have to do with the, uh, the Russians and the West and the Russians in the United States and the EU. Um, I want to argue, though, that they are related, that they are intertwined, and you can't do one without the other. Some people will argue um, that because of the international aspect and the geopolitical aspect of Moldova's politics, that the West has no choice but to support Moldova. Um, blind to anything else, that that, that geopolitical imperative um, is, is, is what we should follow. There are others, you know these, uh, who say unless there is full reform, um, unless there is no corruption, and I'm overstating this a little bit, but, but you get the point, unless, unless all these reforms are pushed through with great vigor, then we can't even help on the geograph. And of course, both pieces are important, both the domestic piece and the international piece. Um, so, um, Prime Minister, I, I will get to other parts of the international, but how do, when, when people ask you um, and your government, um, how these two parts, that is the domestic reform and the international competition, the geopolitical competition, how do they fit together? How do you, how do you traverse that, uh, that difficult terrain? Uh, that's a very good question, a very timely question, because the Republic of Moldova is not an isolated country. And of course, everything that is happening uh, domestically uh, uh, is connected with the foreign relations of the Republic of Moldova. In a public uh, discourse, which I made, a public speech which I made at the beginning of my mandate, I said that unfortunately over uh, the period of 25 years of independence in Moldova, there were politicians, political voices, which tried to find solutions uh, to the problems encountered in Moldova, either in Moscow or in Washington or in Brussels. And I've said back then that the solutions uh, to the problems encountered by Moldova should not be uh, searched for outside the country. The solutions are within the country. That is why uh, what we have to do is to get ready to work, to start working, to promote uh, first develop and then promote and then implement the necessary reforms. Because um, even when we signed the association agreement with the European Union, I said that the integration of the Republic of Moldova in Europe is a matter of domestic policy rather than a matter of external policy. 
through its uh, national domestic policies, the Republic of Moldova has to raise itself to the European standards, and this will bring our country closer to the European Union. That's why, from the very beginning, the government um, program of the current government is based on the association agreement that we have signed with the European Union. We developed a quite broad reform agenda which covers all the areas because it is impossible to have progress in one area without taking into account what is happening in other areas. For example, the previous discussion that I had at the Department of Commerce, I said that uh, the most important thing for business and for investments is uh, ensuring state of law. Because uh, a strong investor will come in a country where he or she will be sure that uh, he'll not be um, uh, unlawfully deprived of his or her business and assets. And if he has a case in court, uh, the trials, the proceedings will be um, correct and fair. Uh, so we started uh, reforming this sector. We focused uh, especially on justice sector. Uh, we reformed the prosecution area, the <coughs> judiciary, we created the National Integrity Agency, the national, uh, reformed the National Anti-Corruption Center, and many, many other uh, reforms. Unfortunately, we are still moving at a slow pace, and um, the latest events which took place in Chisinau, I'm talking about the decisions taken by courts of law which overturn the results of the local elections in Chisinau prove that uh, not everything is good in, um, in justice. There is still a lot to be done in justice. And it is not in vain that at the beginning of this year, when analyzing everything that was done before uh, injustice, we uh, prepared the so-called small reform in justice, which is planned for 2018. And it aims at eliminating other constraints that were identified in this area. Uh, it is about ensuring uh, some clear principles and um, procedures of uh, holding judges um, uh, accountable. So this is um, um, disciplinary accountability for judges. On the other hand, um, it will introduce some clear uh, principles uh, that will filter the um, uh, people that will enter the system to make sure that only uh, people with integrity can become ju judges. In my opinion, everything that happened recently around these court decisions, um, I urge everyone not to draw quick conclusions. Uh, I urge everybody to analyze very carefully, deeply, to see who will have to win as a result of this, and to take the decisions only after a profound analysis. Regarding the external relations, including um, trade uh, relations, but not only trade. Unfortunately, after 2014, when the Republic of Moldova signed an association agreement with the European Union and a free trade agreement, uh, uh, a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, the relationship with the Russian Federation worsened, because unlike European Union, which does not impose any restrictions, and does not uh, limit uh, the possibility of Moldova to cooperate with other states, the Russian Federation has a different position. So the Russian Federation makes you choose either trade relations with the European Union or trade relations with the Russian Federation, or um, better said, with the Euro-Asian Trade Union. The Republic of Moldova has determined its orientation. We do not have either Plan A. We don't have Plan B. We have only Plan A, which is entitled European Orientation. And I believe that we will manage to overcome this difficult relation with the Russian Federation. By the way, the Russian Federation 
imposed the uh, customs tax uh, for 18 um, tariff positions, but which account for 80% of Moldovan exports to the Russian Federation. And actually, this is a violation of the agreements that we have as part of the Commonwealth of Independent States, because Mm, we have an agreement stipulating that uh, trade should be free in the Commonwealth um, area. I hope that uh, soon we'll be able to overcome this issue as well. The Republic of Moldova, um, to make myself uh, very clearly understood, the Republic of Moldova does not have anything against the Russian Federation. The only thing is that during the, our mandate, uh, the Republic of Moldova has said that what we want is to have a correct uh, relationship with the Russian Federation, even if we're very different countries in terms of size and number of population, nevertheless, the relationship should be based on mutual respect. This is what we want in uh, our relationship with any country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I suspect that there will be questions about uh, the election and the court cases. That you that you referred. And you'd probably be disappointed if you didn't get those, those questions. So, so I, I will. Um, but in terms of showing your partners, showing the United States, showing the EU, um, that you in fact are really committed to making these changes, are there things that can be done? Um, I, again, in Ukraine, you recall um, the, uh, the Ukrainians came to the streets after the election, the Orange Revolution in 2004, when there was a corrupt election. Um, and the Ukrainians stayed in the streets until the Supreme Court overturned that election. Do you see any scenario like that um, that would cause, uh, uh, that, that would, re you, you just mentioned that we should analyze this carefully before we jump to conclusions. Um, um, but do you see Moldovans in the streets um, over the weekend pushing for a more rapid uh, resolution to, to that question? Uh, in early 2016, when this government received the vote of trust in the parliament, the protests were much more massive in Chisinau. We took the responsibility uh, to lead the country on the background of a profound crisis and massive protests in Moldova. Throughout the whole period, we proved that we can find solutions to a number of problems and we secured peace within the country. And I said it back then, and this is true for today, that Protests are a form of expressing um, that people have problems. So it's a form of, used by people to express their problems. So myself personally and the team I represent, we try to understand uh, these revolts and to take into account uh, what people want to communicate. So I believe these are pressures of good type for the government because um, they get you mobilized better and they kind of urge you to find quicker a solution. I do not want to forecast what will happen. Uh, what I can tell now is that the government will ensure further on freedom of expression. The government will not intervene with some actions that might uh, limit the freedom of expression and will um, make sure uh, that solutions are identified. Speaking about um, the situation in justice, the government does not have any tools to interfere in the justice. The only thing uh, we can do is to amend the legal framework. So the tools that the government has are related only to amending the legal framework so that when the new, the amended legal framework is implemented, the fundamental rights are not violated. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to that as, as we can anticipate. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to that as we can anticipate. 
Let me ask your foreign minister a, 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 a question that you've alluded to, Prime Minister. Um, relations with Europe and relations with Russia, complicated, complex. Um, you've had ongoing conversations in, in the 5 plus 2, which you mentioned, and the OSCE has played a role. Um, and recently some progress on license plates and bridges and so, so some actual progress um, were made. Recently, so last week, uh, Moldova and others in the UN um, put forward a resolution um, in the General Assembly, not obviously in the Security Council, um, that would ask for, demand, request, all foreign troops to be removed from the sovereign territory of Moldova. Um, the Russians were not pleased. Um, um, how, Foreign Minister, um, did you, how, what was the thinking um, of, mo of, of moving from the OSCE to the UN? Was there a, is there a strategy there? Is this a change in policy? What's, wh how did you come to the uh, decision to go for this resolution? Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for this question. Indeed, uh, on uh, Friday, on June 22nd, uh, a uh, UN resolution has been adopted by a large majority of votes, of 64 votes, in favor for this resolution, named A-72-L.58, slash slash named on uh, complete and unconditional withdrawal of foreign troops from the territory of the Republic of Moldova. This has not been uh, something new. It has been a constant position of the government of the Republic of Moldova since we became independent. And uh, this has been reiterated in the uh, Istanbul OSC summit of 1999, where the Russian Federation has com committed itself to withdraw fully and unconditionally its uh, troops and munitions from the national sovereign territory of the Republic of Moldova. The Prime Minister of the Republic of Moldova, Pavel Filip, has made uh, at his uh, statement at the General Assembly uh, in, in September of, uh, of last year very clearly uh, this priority, uh, which has been reiterated in front of the UN uh, member states. And uh, the vote, the historic vote that occurred on June 22nd has shown uh, international solidarity for Moldova's independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity. And for the first time at the level of the UN, it has been officially recognized that any foreign troops and munitions on Moldova's territory, a UN member state, without its host nation consent is illegal, illegitimate, contradicts with the UN Charter principles, the principles of international law, and the principles of the fact that any country should not have its tro uh, foreign troops on its territory. With regards to, you have mentioned uh, the type of foreign troops, we have to make a very clear distinction of the two types of Russian troops on Moldova's territory. On one hand, based on the 1992 ceasefire agreement between the Republic of Moldova and the Russian Federation, the so-called peacekeeping operation has been uh, created, established, where we have Russian soldiers participating. At the same time, there is the former Soviet 14th Army that is now stationing as the so-called Operative Group of Russian Troops, OGRT. And not only troops, but also munitions amounting to approximately 21,000 tons that are dislocated in the Transnistrian region of the Republic of Moldova. And uh, I do believe that this is a very important opportunity for the Republic of Moldova being backed up by so many countries, and I would like to officially express our full appreciation for the co-sponsors of this resolution that have worked with us on the text and have also expressed their solidarity with Moldova, but also with the entire UN membership. And I do think that it is a historic moment for Moldova to clearly say to the world that Moldova needs to have its territory without foreign troops, 
we would like to have normal, constructive relations with the Russian Federation, but not at the expense of our independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity. And this is a clear message uh, to Moscow at the same time that the UN is supporting the position of the Republic of Moldova. And I do think that at this moment it makes our position stronger. And uh, this is not news to anyone, but it's a sign of solidarity and that countries are supporting the Moldovan government position and the, the vision of our country without uh, foreign troops. <clears throat> That's a good lead-in, actually, to the question for the defense minister. Um, um, minister, I understand that in your constitution, um, it states that the, the policy of Moldova will be neutrality. So, that's, so that suggests um, that um, while you might be eventually um, a member of the EU, probably never a member of NATO. However, um, you've done, the, the Republic of Moldova and the armed forces of Moldova have had some interactions with, uh, with NATO and indeed have contributed to some NATO operations. Um, how, does, how does that work with the Constitution? How does that work with the, uh, your, your defense responsibilities uh, in Transnistria um, and vis-a-vis -vis the Russian Federation? How this, you have a complicated job as well. How, how do you deal with the neutrality that NATO and, and the Russians? Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my, my English is not so good like my... my Your English my, is my foreign better, minister it's English, better than so my I'll, Romanian, I'll I, to, I will, to, or to, my Moldovan, sorry. I'll try to say it in Romanian. It's Roman. for me. <laughs> uh. As you have mentioned, as you have mentioned, the Constitution stipulates that Moldova is a neutral country. And because of that, we cannot be part of a military bloc. But it does not prohibit for us to enter into a strategic partnership with the North Atlantic Alliance. Our partnership with NATO is based on two aspects. First, the military one, and second, the social one. Prime Minister Pavel Filip said, that during the mandate of the current government in the Republic of Moldova a number of reforms were implemented and one of those reforms uh, refers to defense and security. The National Army has initiated a, a complex reform process and uh, this process is um, supported and is guided by our partners uh, from NATO. both at the level of the country individually and at the level of NATO as a whole. The second issue refers to the social partners that I mentioned earlier. Uh, here we speak about military medicine, a, a very important project for the Republic of Moldova, which is the evacuation of pesticides from the territory of the Republic of Moldova, a very ambitious project which um, soon will be completed and using this opportunity I would like to thank all partners, all countries that came with financial contributions to make sure that this project is implemented. <coughs> Recently, we have opened a NATO license office in Chisinau, an office which allows us to apply for more projects initiated by the North Atlantic Alliance. Of course, from the political perspective, uh, for many people, this cooperation is not, um, uh, many people do not agree with this cooperation. But for us as a country who wants to ensure its uh, security and territorial integrity of the country, it is important to develop a national army according to the international and NATO criteria and um, the standards. <laughs> As a reply to your question, I would say that 
we do have this partnership and I believe that in the future it will be strengthened. Minister, you, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister has talked a lot about the importance of, uh, of, of trade. He's also talked about the complications um, of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement on the one hand and the obligations in both directions of the Commonwealth of Independent States um, and the constraints that the Russian Federation would like to put on in possible conflict um, with the obligations and, and opportunities of a free trade agreement with the EU. Um, how, and the Prime Minister has also mentioned how important investment is, and he's in, uh, and emphasized how important the judicial system is for investor confidence. Um, as you look at the, at the relationship with the European market and the CIS market, or the Russian market, how do you, how do you try to um, um, make those compatible? How do you deal with those kinds of, uh, of pressures in both directions? Thank you. <coughs> um, first, I think every market for us is important and we, we are doing everything possible to get new markets on the way as well. The situation that happened uh, uh, four years ago with Russia, for example, the embargo for our pro products, uh, made us better to look forward and to market our products better in uh, looking for some new markets, new, new opportunities. And here the uh, so-called DCFTA, we call it, actually it's a free trade agreement, but DC is deep and comprehensive. Uh, so this uh, free trade ag agreement gave us an opportunity to enter a new market, a big potential uh, number of uh, customers in the European market. Uh, when we signed this agreement, we had a very uh, hard work making uh, and analyzing what would be the benefits for us, for Moldova, uh, uh, by having this agreement signed. So according to those estimations, we, um, the experts showed us a potential increase of 5.4% on the GDP of the country. The 16% growth of the exports towards EU and 8% uh, growth of imports from uh, European Union. Big number of taxes uh, coming down to zero. Uh, today, uh, I'm happy to mention that we are uh, almost 65% of our exports are going to EU. Mm. In the same, and that was a very uh, soft, you know, move from uh, CIS, from Russia market to, uh, to EU market. But I, like I mentioned before, we really worked a lot. We improved our product. We in, invested in the quality of the product. We invested in the marketing of our product. So uh, now that is giving us a possibility to see on the uh, shelves of big uh, chain stores our, uh, our products. And we are happy to, to, to see that. The, uh, in this agreement, we see very clear specification of the quality of the products. The specification of the product itself, like quotas for grapes, for apple, for uh, all type of uh, plums, uh, wines, uh, and different uh, types of uh, uh, food, uh, food product. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> also, we grow in, t in terms of number of companies which are exporting to EU. Today, we... Uh, uh, the total number of companies which are exporting to EU counts like 1,360 mm -hmm. companies. And like I said, the total exports which is going to European market is 60, 60%, 65%. That is not limiting ourselves. The DCFTA agreement or free trade agreement of European Union is not limiting ourselves only towards this market. I was so happy yesterday, walking on uh, Washington in uh, Georgetown somewhere. We stopped at one uh, shop, winery shop. I, on purpose, I entered that shop. And I was asking to the owner, uh, do you have Moldovan wine? Mm -hmm. He said, yes, you find it somewhere yeah, there on the shop. Very good. Even I make some, some pictures. I was so happy to see <laughs> big number of different uh, uh, products, wine, winery products from Moldova 
on the shelves in, Very good. in, in, in center of Washington. So that is showing that, okay, our products are not limited to the European market. We, we can see and find them uh, everywhere, including China. I'm sure uh, over there, there will be some uh, stores where you'll find. Uh, but talking about wine, this is one of the products we are happy and we are proud to provide all around the world. This is uh, very quality, very tasty, and uh, that's something we Yes, some of you, you know, have been to Moldova, so... Moldovan wine is world famous. Um, Krikova is uh, also world famous, so many of us have, uh, have been there as well. Thank you, Minister. Um, good, so a very, a, a, a very wide set of issues. Um, let me now ask the, those of you who have uh, come here to, uh, to, oh, right, and here is a question right away here. Why don't you start right here? I think this is a Moldovan. <laughs> so uh, there's a microphone. You can state your name, and if you have a specific minister or prime minister that you'd like to address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hello, my name is Inga Afanasieva, and I'm, I'm here in my private capacity as citizen of Moldova. Really glad for the opportunity to be here because uh, those of us who are from diaspora, we know that the meeting with the Prime Minister has been cancelled. We were very disappointed. So here I am to ask a couple of questions. Um, so um, the one thing you wouldn't be disappointed, Ambassador Taylor, it is about the court decision. Um, the fact that the meeting with the diaspora was cancelled is the least of the offences of this government. Uh, we all know that the Supreme Court of Justice has just upheld a lower court decision to um, annul the results of the elections for the city hall, for the mayor of the um, Kishino. And that led to protests in, uh, in the streets. Now, my question to the Prime Minister is, I hear from what you said earlier that you seem surprised by the decision. However, we know that we have a captured state. The public institutions do serve the private interest of Vlad Plachotniuk and his cronies. And now with this decision of the court, we also have a captured society in which our votes no longer count. So my question to you is, Prime Minister, what are you going to do the moment you land in Chisinau? And from what you said earlier, should I deduct that you will join the protesters? And my second question is about the reforms. So I hear here about um, you know, the reform of the judiciary system, the reforms that we're doing in the military. However, the Center for uh, the Anti-Corruption Center was created more than a decade ago. The elimination of pesticides, the evacuation of pesticides, that's a two decades affair. Let's talk about things that you have done. And the three priorities that you mentioned, one was uh, infrastructure development, the second one was education, reform in education, and thirdly was uh, judiciary reform. I would really like to hear the things that you will do to change the current system, the current situation. Because, you know, coming and telling us about things that previous governments have done, or things that have happened long time ago, that will not, that will not improve the situation. So I really want to hear exactly what you're going to do. Inga, you very good question. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Prime Minister, do you want to start off with this? Thank you very much for these questions. After I land in Chisinau, I will go and I'll continue to work and I will do exactly the same things that I have been done I have been doing for the past two years and a half. In my speech I referred only to the reforms that were implemented by the current government. When I uh, referred to the National Anti-Corruption Center, I did not mean its establishment, but its re uh, reform. This was a very important reform. Let me give you an answer item by item. I have many questions regarding this court decision, the decision of the Supreme Court of Justice, which um, upheld uh, the decision of the appellate court and which upheld the um, decision of the first instance court. My question is who will have to win as a result of this decision being taken? And my answer is for sure not our government, not the current government. 
and I will give you arguments in this regard. The opposition, since early 2016, used to ask the external partners not to give money to the Republic of Moldova. Uh, this was made they made an addressing directly to IMF not to give money to the Republic of Moldova because this government is formed by oligarchs who do not work for citizens. Those from IMF have a very pragmatic attitude and they took into account the things that we actually done. So we've managed to sign a program with the International Monetary Fund. We have reached the third review already. Thanks to this program, other external funding was uh, deblocked, including the EU funding. I will not tell you what uh, this program covers, uh, but uh, before that we used to have a roadmap with the European Commission consisting of 28 points and all the reforms envisaged in that roadmap were implemented. Why now we have this decision when the Republic of Moldova uh, was expected to receive in one week time macrofinancial assistance from the European Union. Uh, the Republic of Moldova, after the European Commission already took the decision to provide um, direct budget support. So to take into account other uh, funding, the total volume was about 100 million euro. On the basis of all the um, statements that we have heard both locally and from outside, uh, there is a huge risk that as a result of this court decision, uh, the Republic of Moldova will not receive this funding. And this is what will hit the current government. And no one will change my opinion. One more thing I would like to say. I want to say what this government approved in the justice sector. This is about the law on the prosecution, which envisages um, uh, the establishment of specialized prosecution offices. You know that it was not possible to approve this uh, law for a number of years, and it is uh, it was coordinated with our external partners. After this, we implemented this strategy on the justice sector. After, we also <coughs> developed the anti-corruption strategy. We also approved the legal framework on the establishment of the National Integrity Agency. And this agency was already set up. Uh, uh, and now they are employing the necessary staff. We also created the agency for the recovery of crime assets. I believe that not everyone liked this. And we have to be frank, uh, we have to say that lots of things were done in justice. But still, there are many problems unsolved. What it is important now is to continue the reforms that were started. They have to be fully implemented. That's very important. I do not want to speak about all the other reforms that were included in the broad uh, reform agenda of the government. So I'll just say that I have many questions regarding this court decision. Who will have to, who will win, who will be the winners as a result of this um, situation? And I believe we will soon find an answer to this question. But if we, rel <coughs> uh, if we are very emotional, and I understand very well the opposition because they try to gain political dividends as a result of this. But I believe we need to have a pragmatic approach. We have to think with a cold mind, uh, and then we'll find an answer regarding the captured state and so on and so forth. I do not want to comment these things because if we captured the state in order to implement a reform agenda, that's one thing. But I am tired from one perspective to um, to receive these accusations during this period 
last period of times and I said that the best appreciation or the, uh, our development partners um, uh, are in the best position to assess our work so they have a pragmatic approach and they can assess whether we have fulfilled the commitments that we uh, took. Defense reforms, uh, the current defense reforms. Uh, when I spoke about the pesticides, I did not uh, present it as a reform. I, regarding the reform that we do in defense area, I would like to say that it is for the first time in the history of Moldova of 27 years when money is invested in the National Army. Uh, when we are not begging from our partners to ask, government has started to invest in the national security. Recently, a program was approved entitled Professional Army. It is a very ambitious program for a three-year period. Its goal is to enhance the professional level of the National Army. It also envisages a gradual um, increase in the budget for defense and also appropriate um, uh, equipment up to the international standards. <laughs> replacement of the old uh, Soviet uh, equipment and arm, armament. We will soon approve the national defense strategy. Uh, this document has a strategical um, importance. We didn't have such a document before. Now it is in the parliamentary committees and it will be approved soon. Regarding the cooperation with NATO, immediately when the national defense strategy is approved, we will approve the military strategy. Again, this strategy was developed together with our partners from the North Atlantic Alliance. And it somehow, it, it shows how the National Army will be re-engineered, how it should be equipped. And this process has one purpose, to ensure internal security. As we are a neutral state, we have to assure our um, uh, security by ourselves, but also to be able to contribute to the regional security, both in NATO format and UN format. Alet Mirkulov, Business Baltia Media Group from Riga, Latvia. Uh, what percentage of the population in Moldova considers Russian language their native language? And also, are there any plans in Moldova to follow example of Latvia, which many human rights activists consider discriminatory, to eliminate all Russian language education, including privately funded institutes and schools? Thank you. Unfortunately, I do not know the latest statistical data regarding the percentage of uh, people who regard Russian as their native language, but uh, what I can tell you, we have approved a strategy for national minorities in the Republic of Moldova, and we will make sure that uh, the right to study in the native language is ensured, as well as the right to express uh, oneself in the language uh, that uh, one knows and wants to use. Uh, and again, that's an artificial program created artificially in the Republic of Moldova. A problem that is launched by politicians in order to divide the society. We inherited a divided society. A part of the population looks towards Russia, another part of the population looks towards the West. But this is fostered by some political parties which use such messages in order to gain more votes, uh, either pro-Russian votes or pro-Western votes. Uh, what we focus on 
is on the economic dimension and on increasing the welfare of all citizens of the Republic of Moldova. It does not matter the nationality and it does not matter what language they speak. The Republic of Moldova should have a unified population. Another thing that I want to tell you is about the popularity of the um, uh, orientation towards European Union or um, uh, Euro-Asian. And one thing I'm proud of is that one of my ambitious objectives announced from the very beginning was to make sure that the European path is, becomes an irreversible path for the Republic of Moldova. And if at the beginning of 2016 only 34% of our population were for EU and 49 were for Euro-Asian Union. According to the latest surveys made by the European Commission, we can see that 60% now are for European Union and only 34% are for the Euro-Asian Union. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Nicoletta Nikifor, and I'm a graduate student at uh, Georgetown University Arab Studies program. So I have uh, two questions questions for uh, Minister Ulyanovsky. Ulyan uh, first one is with regard to the UN resolution that was uh, adopted. I wanted to ask uh, on its implications because, uh, uh, as you mentioned, this is not a new uh, issue and it's known for uh, many years, but uh, what are the next steps uh, considering the outcome of the vote that we saw at the UN? And the second question is related to the Middle East, because as Ambassador Taylor mentioned at the beginning, the external politics of the Republic of Moldova is very complicated. Uh, we have uh, the relations with uh, US, uh, EU, Russia, but also I wanted to say about the Middle East, and we have the opening of the embassies, and we have the one in Doha and in the Emirates very recently. So I wanted to ask you about that. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for the question. I will speak in English, not in Arabic, uh, <laughs> um, because I have worked previously in Qatar, in Doha. And indeed, uh, as Thomas Friedman says, you know, the world is flat today, and I think Moldova has to diversify, and it is diversifying uh, its uh, bilateral and multilateral cooperation. Uh, Middle East, of course, is a, uh, is a topic of hot interest for the world politics, and Moldova should be engaged and should uh, uh, be following the developments on the ground, but also not losing the opportunities to establish direct cooperation with emerging markets and uh, having in mind the investment opportunities provided by countries where we have opened uh, recently embassies, that is Qatar and also UAE. And uh, I am particularly proud to have the support of the Prime Minister that we have managed to finally open uh, just a couple of months ago the embassy in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. And uh, it was extremely rewarding when uh, I was there to open the, the embassy together with the Minister of Economy as well, who was uh, participating at the first uh, Moldova UAE business forum. There were so many Moldovans participating at the opening uh, ceremony of the embassy and they were even crying and thank you. they're saying thank you so much for this government that they were thinking for the huge amounts of Moldovans living in JCC area. And this is, uh, in my opinion, uh, reflects the priority of foreign policy, meaning geopolitical cooperation with the Middle East, uh, domestic and foreign economic diplomacy, working on bilateral economic relations and trade, volume expansion, and third, the fact that the priority of the government of Moldova and of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are the Moldovan community living abroad and in this particular situation in JCC area. So I do think it's a win-win and I do have high hopes that we'll be able to further expand the potential of this cooperation. And I do believe on a separate note that uh, Moldova should have diplomatic presence on every continent in the world because uh, today you have to be everywhere and that 
leads to my uh, to your first question with relationship to the U UN resolution. Uh, to have, and we had the support and solidarity of so many member states from various parts of the world. Of course, there was a common EU position on that. Uh, we had the support of Northern America, but we have support and we took a lot of effort to reach out to Latin American countries because still we don't have an embassy there. It took uh, us an effort to reach to African countries because of the number and uh, the priorities that they have. And uh, that is why I do think that in the near future, and uh, we, it was initiative of this government to open uh, a Moldovan embassy on every continent. And that will help us in the future to get even bigger and stronger support from all the regions in the world. Uh, with regards to, to, to your first question on, uh, on this uh, resolution, indeed, as I mentioned, it was a sh strong show of solidarity of the UN. Uh, this is a non sanctioning or not legally binding resolution, but it's a strong manifesto of the level of the UN that foreign troops should leave the territory of the Republic of Moldova. The operative group of Russian troop forces uh, should be evacuated, withdrawn, as also the ongoing peacekeeping operation should be transformed into an international civilian uh, operation uh, as soon as possible. And I do believe, I'm a strong believer in the 5 plus 2 format, in the confidence building measures, which have registered positive results. <coughs> and if this force or military element with be, will be withdrawn from, the, uh, from this context of uh, negotiations, it will give a much better potential in a peaceful manner without any military pressure for the consultations and for the implementation of the confidence building measures uh, to, reach, to have better results, to have the results faster. Uh, indeed, I do believe that it, the resolution that has just been passed will allow us to use the UN as a further platform to initiate other actions, initiatives, and uh, to have the international community's support to send a very clear message to the Russian Federation that the foreign troops or the Russian troops and munitions should be withdrawn from the national territory of the Republic of Moldova. So I do thank you for the question and uh, thank you for reminding me of my previous experience in the Mid Middle East. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, uh, right here and then yeah, we'll go back. Uh, Mike Eckel from Radio Free Europe. I wanted to come back to the issue of the uh, the High Court's, uh, the Supreme Court's uh, decision and pinpoint exactly what your position on the court's decision is. You seem to be suggesting that it perhaps was illegitimate, that there was, the court may have been tainted by, I don't know, political influence. What exactly do you propose to do about it, if anything? Also, your answer to the previous question suggested uh, that there will be winners that result from this court's decision. And then you go on to talk about the political opposition reaping political div div dividends from the court's decision. In your opinion, who, who is the winner from this decision? Is it the political opposition? Is that what you're saying? Thank you. I do not want to express my opinion whether this decision was lawful or not. I will just express my opinion because um, lawyers or those who have uh, education in law and know this area can tell us whether this is lawful or not. But my opinion and using the knowledge that I have I think some violations were done during the electoral period, but the violations were not that many so that uh, the result of the election be overturned. So if there were some violations, uh, maybe the court could have issued a, a fine or other form of sanctioning the electoral competitors. Who will have to win as a result of this? I leave you to decide, uh, but the information that I gave to you show that the current government uh, will be affected by this uh, decision, by this court decision. 
what I want to say is that we need to have a very profound and deep analysis of what was happened and we have to try to connect more dots because I remember an important reform that I uh, really am proud of and we managed to implement was the reform of the pension system in the Republic of Moldova when we tried to bring more um, equity among all categories of people, all groups of people. And of course, um, under the old system, judges were very much uh, privileged. For example, uh, the pension was 80% from the salary. So from the very beginning, the salaries of judges was much higher than the salary of a teacher or a doctor. And the replacement rate of for pension is about 26%. We developed a law. We approved it in the government. After this, it was approved by the parliament. But the judges mobilized, they joined their forces, and they appealed this law at the Constitutional Court. And the chapter focusing on the pension for judges was overturned, was annulled. So I have many questions regarding what happened this time. One more time, I will say, I do not see any logics in these actions. And I believe that the political class uses what happens now for their political purposes in order to have more political dividends before the parliamentary elections that are planned for late this year in the Republic of Moldova. On the other hand, just a couple of words more, throughout the whole period, uh, when the first instance court approved its judgment, I was contacted by representatives of a number of external partners. I will not give you names. So they came, they met with me, and they told me, look what happened uh, now in the court of law. It's catastrophic, but you have time, two days, uh, to make sure that the appellate court issues another judgment. But my question was, what can I do as prime minister? I did not get an answer to this question. And still, I don't know what is the answer to this question. Uh, what should I have done? Should I pick up the phone and call the judge? Uh, should I have went to the court? Why? What could I have done? Because if you try to put pressure on the court, this automatically leads to a criminal case. All the tools that we had our public pressure. I made a statement where I presented my position regarding uh, this uh, court decision. Because the government can only uh, come up with legislative initiatives to amend the legal framework in order not to give any space of interpretation for judges. And this is exactly what we are doing. We analyze the situation, we try to see the problems that still exist, and then we review again the legal framework. That's how we ended up with the small justice, uh, small reform in justice, as we call it, that is supposed to be implemented by the end of this year. Three final questions here, and we'll bundle them up, uh, if that's okay with you. Um, I've, I've said, so that's one. Um, two and three. So, we'll do that. so first one right here. Hello, Andrew Costello from IREX. Uh, I actually work on USAID's new Communitate EMEA <laughs> program, um, working on direct uh, citizen participation, decentralization, uh, reform in Moldova. And so, my question is where do you all see the future of decentralization reform in the country? <clears throat> Good, so decentralization, first question. Second question, Manuela. 
Thank you. Manuela Mott is my name, and uh, I'm here in a um, capacity as a Romanian citizen. And I have a question for uh, Prime Minister of Moldova. Um, as Ambassador Taylor had mentioned previously, you live in a very complicated uh, environment, and this is also given by your dependency upon uh, Russian energy. So what are you doing to uh, increase the share of uh, energy supply from uh, other sources than uh, your Russian neighbor, and maybe you can uh, give us uh, a little bit of updates on uh, uh, the projects that you have um, uh, ongoing with Romania on electricity and uh, gas, and perhaps maybe you have uh, also some other uh, projects in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here, right here, yes. Um, so first here, and then we are going to get to, okay, Ambassador Smith here, and then, then you. Two, so we'll have four questions here, Ambassador I'm Smith. I'm sorry. You, no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Um, well, those of us who have lived and worked uh, in Moldova love it and want to see only the very best for Moldova. It is very encouraging to hear that trade is moving in a sustainable direction. I have heard that tourism is also uh, a becoming a strong sector of the economy. Uh, I think we all know that some of Moldova's most talented young people um, are actually in the diaspora and uh, need to be listened to and dealt with and made part of the political dialogue. Uh, I hope that can happen. Um, so to sustain the positive trends and put the negatives um, more to rest, it would seem to me that another embrace of democratic, uh, transparent governance is essential. And an early way to demonstrate uh, the importance and commitment to such principles uh, would be in the upcoming election, to make sure that it is free and fair and observed uh, and seen to be free and fair as well. Comments would be welcome. <coughs> Thank you, Ambassador. Last question right here, right behind you. Very good. Uh, I'm uh, Omid Iskari, uh, in capacity here as a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, my gratitude, Mr. Prime Minister, and your cabinet for coming here today at the uh, U.S. Institute of Peace and, and uh, dialoguing with us. Uh, my question, uh, one topic of which the Prime Minister referred to, um, and someone else in the audience um, as well, uh, regards the Republic of Moldova's uh, concern of uh, energy security. Uh, and I'm interested also in uh, Mr. Kapuric's uh, uh, opinion on this as the Minister of Economy. Um, besides the nearly 20% of Moldova's energy that comes from uh, renewable sources, electricity, etc., um, what specific steps uh, is the Republic taking uh, to create a competitive uh, market in fossil fuels um, that can uh, better ease uh, its integration into the European economy? Thank you. Um, so, four questions, but two of them are on energy. Um, uh, and then, and Prime Minister, I'm told by your folks that it's okay to go a little bit after the 3.30 time. So if we will, we'll uh, use this to wrap up. Is that okay, Victoria? Uh, to, uh, very good. <laughs> Prime Minister. I would like to thank everyone for these questions. These are very important questions, and I'm very glad that you follow the developments in the Republic of Moldova. The first question referred to decentralization of the Republic of Moldova, sorry, territorial decentralization in the Republic of Moldova. During this mandate, I insisted on the central administration reform and we reformed the government. As a result of this reform, we out of 16 ministries, we have only nine ministries. The positions of deputy ministers were cancelled and we introduced the position of um, state secretaries. This was a very important thing because the deputy ministers would come and go when the government changed because they were um, state uh, dignitaries. But state secretaries are public officials who, do, who are not removed when uh, the government is replaced, which means that in the ministries we will ensure continuity of the policies. and institutional memory. Uh, 
uh, all the economic uh, companies were removed uh, from uh, the subordination of ministries and now they are subordinated to the public agency, public procurement agency, and what means that uh, ministers will focus on policies, not on management of companies. Now we work on the reform of local public administration, the territorial administrative reform, because in the Republic of Moldova currently we have more than 900 uh, mayor's offices, which for our number of population is a huge number. We work uh, on several models, or we have several scenarios, and hopefully we'll finalize the concept of this reform, we will consult it with the Congress of local authorities, and hopefully we will implement it immediately after the parliamentary elections. Our goal, I have to admit, is very optimistic. Our objective is to manage to implement this reform after the parliamentary elections, before the next local elections. Regarding electricity or energy, I will uh, allow Minister of Economy to reply, but in general I would like to say that we have been always worried about this issue because the Republic of Moldova had only one supplier of energy and of course um, it was very vulnerable because of this. We can divide it in two areas, gas and uh, electricity. Uh, regarding uh, gas, uh, a project was uh, developed with envisages connecting Moldova to the gas system of Romania, which actually means connection to the EU uh, gas system. Uh, this project was very important for me. Unfortunately, the deadlines that you plan never will coincide with what you have in real life. But in the end, we had to find a solution so that uh, the Republic of Moldova does not invest this money because uh, it's a huge amount of money. And at the same time, to be um, in, uh, secured with an alternative uh, supply of gas, and this was possible after reaching an agreement with our colleagues from Romania. And here I'm referring to Transgas, who accepted to take over this project and to make this investment in the Republic of Moldova through by uh, purchasing the Westmold Transgas company. And this, according to this project. The uh, construction works will start in uh, September and it is planned to implement it within 10 months because the distance is not that long. In such a way, in mid-2019, the Republic of Moldova will have already um, energy security on the gas side. Regarding electricity, Initially, we had some talks to ensure not only security but also energy independence in terms of electricity. After having a number of discussions with the experts who know very well this area, we reached the conclusion that Moldova should not invest in an atomic plant or other plants to produce electricity because our neighbors, I speak about Romania and Ukraine, produce electricity more than they need. So there is no sense for us to invest in this. It is important to make sure that we can take electricity both from Romania and from Ukraine. And for this, uh, the, the systems are different. We have asynchronous and synchronous systems. So there are two possibilities, either together with Ukraine to align to the um, single electricity transportation system of the European Union. This. Uh, requires a longer period of time. And another project is to install a 
back-to-back -back station, which ensures transportation of electricity from one system to another, either from Romania to Moldova or from Moldova to Romania. And I believe this is more realistic project. Funding is necessary, and for this we have already signed an agreement with uh, EBRD. And um, the first connection will be done from Salcha Volkanyash Kishinau, and then we'll have two other interconnections with Romania. Regarding your question with elections, I was the one who was very glad oh, that to hear the results of the local elections. I declared that we had free and correct relations, and I said that this is proved by the fact that the elections were won by a representative of the opposition. And I was really glad to hear who won the elections. But the recent events show us that the issue here is not to organize uh, fair and open elections. The problem relies in the justice sector. And one more thing I would like to say, which I did not say today, I represent a political formation as well. And this precedent that was created now is dangerous for my political formation as well, for the parliamentary elections. That is why before then, I believe we have as a matter of emergency to analyze and for us to fully understand what happened and to come with the necessary corrective measures in the legal framework related to justice sector to make sure that once people express their vote and elections were fair and transparent, no one to have the possibility to intervene for the court not to be able to intervene in any way. So these were the questions. Thank you very much for these questions. I don't know if the minister would like to add something. So the, there are basically three uh, main important things. One is the uh, gas, and we have it done already uh, in terms of documentation. So we signed the agreement begin end of March, 28th of March, uh, on this uh, uh, perspective. Uh, we are working now, uh, we have a big group from our team working on the documentation side, uh, including the uh, expropriation uh, of the lands, including the construction documentation and approvals authorizations and stuff like that. They are working from their side. Uh, we uh, have uh, the plan to start end of August. So as Prime Minister mentioned, uh, next year we will have this, uh, this alternative. Second is the uh, electricity security. And we have a, a main task to take a decision this year and to start upon, uh, based on that decision, the way we are getting connected. And the third one is the renewables. You mentioned about that. And uh, uh, I, I'm glad to, to mention that we have the law in place this year. Uh, the law uh, is motivating the business to get on, to come and invest in, in, in this sector, is reglementating the, 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 the rules of the, the, this uh, specific market. And all these efforts government is doing in order to uh, give a better independence to the Republic of Moldova. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, you will agree um, that we had a good discussion here. Uh, some difficult problems addressed directly. We appreciate that. Um, um, I said at the beginning that uh, Moldova is an interesting but complicated uh, country. Um, uh, and, and, and <clears throat> Ambassador Courtney th th wanted to learn about Moldova, and I think he's learned a lot about that uh, uh, here this afternoon. We've also learned that there is Moldovan wine in Georgetown. So if this is, uh, this is good, we can go uh, buy some uh, of that. But I, I, I want to just conclude um, 
uh, I, you had a good meeting, I understand, with uh, Secretary of State, Secretary Pompeo. Um, and he said uh, that we want to be your staunch ally, uh, but make it easy for us. And make it easy for us is the reform that you've been talking about, in particular the one that Ambassador Smith just talked about. In terms, You have a real opportunity on upcoming elections. And Prime Minister, your comment, your last comment about lessons learned from the election, um, as well as the judicial reform that's necessary, I think are, are very important. And we'll see how the elections come out. Um, before, let me thank the interpreter who did a great job. Thank you very much behind the screen. You can't see her, but she's done a fine job. And please join me in thanking the Prime Minister and his cabinet for being with us today. Thank you.